was going to start this today. I thought all day about how I was going to start this. And what I think the purpose of this night is, is to share a glimpse with you of the mystery of music. Hopefully inspire some of the mystery of music within you. And I was thinking where to start on this thing that the greatest musicians of all time have seen as endless. And I think it would be helpful to figure out where the meaning is within music. So there are notes over time and you can hear them go by in long form and they're stacked on top of each other in harmony. And what is really important is not every single note, but it is the space between the notes. A note in isolation would be almost meaningless, it'd be vacuous, it'd be like a person with another person to talk to. What the bulk is in music is the relationship between the notes, just like it is from person to person. Um, just like it is within this table right here in front of us. Um, you can't pass a solid through a solid. Why? Well, it's because it's solid. What's solid about it? This table is made up of atoms. We can look at the atom. What's solid about the atom? It's the nucleus. The nucleus is the size of a housefly in a football stadium. And this table is solid because all these little tiny things called electrons are communicating with each other. It's, it's hardly, hardly solid at all. What is important, what is holding this table together is the relationships. That's why you can't pass a solid through a solid. I think music is the same way. What is important across time, so you could just have a snare drum playing a rhythm across time, the time intervals and how those relate to each other are important, and harmony is the exact same way. So we can look at the very foundation, the, the start of Western harmony, or the start of the cate categorization of Western harmony in music theory, and that is Pythagoras. He was the first person to start writing stuff down. There was music before him, but as far back as we can see in music theory is the classics. And what Pythagoras did is he experimented with strings. He took two strings of equal length, um, thickness, and force applied to both ends, so tightness. And he figured out that when you vibrated these strings at the same time, they would produce the same note. So all those variables in common, you could say this is X frequency, this would also produce X frequency. And he had just invented, I think, integers, and he was putting them to good use here. What he noticed is that if you changed the size of one of the strings by applying pressure on it, so this much of the string would be vibrating, and you vibrated this string and this string at the same time, it would produce two kinds of tones. The tones would be consonant and dissonant. Consonant being pleasing to the ear and dissonant being displeasing to the ear. And he also noticed that there were way more dissonant tones than consonant tones. So he wanted to see how he could mathematically figure out which tones were consonant and predict. What he did is he thought the middle tone between these two must be consonant. So he took one string, divided it exactly in half, and he vibrated it. Like that. And this was consonant. So we can call this x and 2x. Now this interval is the most important interval there is. Um, this is the only interval that spans across all cultures of music. If there is harmony, this interval is within the harmony. Um, in modern day, it's called the octave, and it's what, it's the difference, the natural difference between the male singing range and the female singing range. So he wanted to figure out the exact middle point, and what he did is he averaged them. So x plus two x over two, you get three x over two. This turned out to be a perfect fifth. He also found that if you made this point C, and you could call this A and B, um, A is to B, as A minus C is to C minus B. And if you go through and do the algebra on this, this is what you come out to, 4x over 3. And 4x over 3 happens to be a perfect fourth. Now, I think that these intervals are beautiful because there are so many ways to derive these intervals. It's a whole self-contained unified system. And I think in mathematics, it's called elegance when something works out to be look really good. If you took a perfect fifth, so let me erase some of this jarble. If you took a perfect fifth, the black mark there might, might work better too. Okay. Yeah. 
say x, and then a perfect fist is 3x over 2, and you brought this down an octave, so 3x over 2 would be cut in half or multiplied by 2 to bring it down an octave, because that's the relationship between an octave. You would have a perfect fourth in relation to x. So switching these up gives you a circle of fourths and fifths, and Pythagoras valued simplicity, so he wanted to construct a scale. And what he did is he stacked fifths, so he kept doing this over and over. So you had x, and then 3x over 2. I'm actually going to call this a note, we can call this c, and then g, and then he kept doing this. So he would have done 3x over 2 for g, and you get d, a, and e. And when you condense this into one octave, this is the scale you get. This scale is the pentatonic scale, the major pentatonic scale. And it sounds like this. It was used for very, very many years and is the most simple construction of notes you can get. You'll probably recognize that. on a scale, and he found it in the simplest way possible. Now, this is also important, the way this happens to work out, the fifth and the fourth, because it relates to the intrinsic nature of music. So, for a long time, I thought that notes were arbitrary. Um, like, what's the difference between a B-flat and an A? Um, you eventually go down far enough and you get an A, like the whole system is just a scale. But it turns out it's not. The, the relativity, again, again here, matters. So there's this thing called the overtone series. And it is a natural phenomenon. It's naturally occurring. We can measure it through physics. When a tone is played, there are natural frequencies that vibrate above the sounding tone. They vibrate to a lesser degree. And differences in the ratio that these vibrate are timbre. So a flute sounds different than an oboe sounds different than a clarinet because their overtones are vibrating at different ratios comparative to one another. So the first interval within the overtone series is an octave. Same as right there, x and 2x, male and female voices. The next interval is a fifth, 3 over 2. The first interval that this guy, Pythagoras, was able to figure out by integers, the next one is a perfect fourth in relation to the fifth. It's another c. So if you had c, that'd be c, g, c. And I'll keep going later, because it turns out that if we look at music over the most vast distance of time, which is categorized from like right here, the beginning of music theory, to um, when music hit its most complex epitome in throughout period, we are unlocking this as human beings over time. So this thing that's woven into nature actually becomes categorized into our ear through our use of harmony. Okay, how? So we start, we can start in the Renaissance period, um, this will be pre-1510. And in the Renaissance period, there were lots of scales. It wasn't just the pentatonic scale. They, there was like liturgy, and they had mixolydian scales and lydian scales, all kinds of cool stuff. You guys are probably familiar with it, like chants are within these scales. But chants are very often sung in perfect fifth and perfect fourth. Um, and that is the vertical aspect of music. So the horizontal aspect, the scale over time, was very interesting and it wasn't just um, pentatonic, but this stayed perfect fourths, perfect fifths, and octaves up until 1510. We weren't able to unlock the third, and I say unlock because it really is intrinsic to nature. Our western scale has been unlocked over time and it's woven into physics and the way things just naturally work. And in 1510, the major third became a consonant interval. It became a constant interval in people's ears. So that isn't to say the major third didn't exist and it wasn't ever played, but people didn't hear it as something that was pleasing to the ear until about 1510 and a little bit afterward. And from 1510, and uh, the Baroque period is birthed in 1600. And the composer, the father of music, uh, Papa Bach, we, we know him and we love him, he is the great master of chromaticism and tonality. Um, Bach was able to use everything before him, so fifths and fourths, in addition to the next one. So above this C, 
is an E. And this is important because this is an octave, here's a fifth, here's a fourth, here's a third. This E unlocks, translates directly into Baroque music, translates directly into Bach, and it opens up in a completely new tonal world. Because once you have a third, you have the, found the foundation of Western harmony. All the harmonies we hear nowadays, everything in a pop song, um, all the way up until Debussy. Debussy did something a little bit different. He harkened back to the real old days. But um, everything is based off this third. And you can go another third up. And then you have this sound that Aaron Copeland never got tired of. That's a, that's a major triad. <laughs> really quick. Oh, I'll play these intervals for you. So increasing complexity. Here, this is a C. This is an octave. and a fifth. Um, the, C, the G C interval is a fourth, so I'll play a C F interval, which is the same thing as I showed you earlier, like you can make a circle with a fifth and a fourth. So all those are pleasing to the ear, and that's what our guy Pythagoras found. But this interval was not pleasing to the ear until 1500. Then you have a major triad. So Baroque music is an extremely complex music, and it is complex because all the stuff that is happening, both vertically and horizontally, the going this way, the melodies that Bach used are extremely long and complicated. They last for, sometimes like his fugues last for 40 measures, and they're in extraordinarily intense. And in addition to having one single line that runs through time, he makes more melodic lines run on top of each other. This is called polyphony. And this is important because in addition to having one complex line going this way, you have another one that's stacked on top of it at the same time. It has to complement the one that's below it or above it perfectly. So. He was thinking, I guess as a genius thinks, um, in the most beautiful fashion where everything he does is compact and meaningful. And by the end of the Baroque period, fugues were getting to like eight parts and they were very difficult. They are very difficult for us to hear. Like you can be trained for eight years or 10 years as a classical musician and still not hear Baroque fugues like Bach heard Baroque fugues. As a testament to how unbelievably complex these things are. So music from the beginning is more and more complex up until this point, and then there's a trend there that breaks the trend, or there's a moment that breaks the trend, and we call this the Enlightenment. So we're unlocking all these cool musical things, and then the Enlightenment happens, and there's a huge shift in values, and the shift in values translates into a shift in harmony. And you probably know the music of Mozart. Mozart is a product of the Enlightenment. It is easy to understand, what happens is that the polyphony, the two melodies, four melodies going on at the same time, gets reduced to one melody and an understandable harmony. And one more very interesting thing happens, and this is another theme that runs through all of the music, is how much freedom is available to the performer and how much expression is possible to the music. So it turns out there is an inverse ratio between these two where the more a performer is restricted by the composer, the more expression the music is capable of expressing. And I think this is, it speaks to the value of discipline. So what happened in the classical music shift is tonality got way more simple. Like Bach went all over the place. He was able to play all 12 notes of the scale and Mozart stuck with the C and the G. So like this is the perfect fifth. If this is x, this is 3 over 2x. Oops, 3x over 2. Um, sometimes you use a fourth. But he almost stuck here, and he'd go back and forth between the key of C and G, and this was the whole landscape of classical music, and it's because it's a very logical landscape. It mirrors the values of the Enlightenment, where reason it, it takes form. And people are naturally able to understand this. It's simple and easy to understand.
and then one single person comes along who changes music more than anyone else ever has changed music. He's the reason this arrow exists. Like, it's a uh, Beethoven. The angry one. <laughs> so, what this guy does is he takes the enlightenment value of form and he puts it to a lesser degree in the priority hierarchy of music. So if form is extremely valuable to classical musicians, musicians of the classical era, Beethoven says that's going to take second to harmony. And he emphasizes the unstable harmony more than the stable harmony that's emphasized within the classical structure. So I often think of music as taking a breath. And over here could be home, and over here could be chaos. And it's constantly going back and forth between the two. People of the Enlightenment really want order. They want home. They want to be able to understand things. Beethoven almost stays exclusively over here. His harmonies are so unstable. And for really long periods of time, like, he has a, this piece called the Coriolan Overture. It's often cited to be like this obsessive sounding piece where the cellos, they never stop running and they never stop going forward in this unstable march. What this allowed Beethoven to do is it allowed him to break the form of classical music. And when I say form, um, there are very specific constructions uh, across time that have been codified in classical music. One of them is the symphonic form, where there is a passage of music that's played in the beginning, it's repeated, it moves on, it's developed, something new is introduced, and then this comes back at the very end. Beethoven looks at this and he says, fine, I'll keep your form, but I'm not going to do it with your key. So in classical music, this is a cool, really cool important part. This might be in the key of tonic X, this would be in the key of modulating, this would be in the key of 3 over 2X, and this would be back home. Beethoven disregards this completely, and he takes the unstable side of music, and he focuses it on it almost completely. Um, it's hard to hold him. And I bet you guys have experienced this when you listen to him. Um, you hear the clash of tonality versus this quality of never being truly at home. It's a sense of almost fighting, like he's fighting against the music in a way that he eventually wins. Um, okay, after Beethoven. In his revolution, we move into the Romantic era of music. Now, the Romantic era of music is split between many different groups. This is where nationalism started to occur in music. And if humans have big ears over time, and we're finally unlocking all these things, there are lots and lots of splits that happen here. There becomes an, a German sound, there becomes a French sound, there is... Russian. Russian, the Russian school. And all these, instead of following the trend of music, it has kind of existed like this. They break off and they do their own things, and they develop their own ideas, um, which makes it a little bit difficult to categorize this tonal segments of music. They, they use very similar things in very different ways. So there is an unstable chord called a fifth, bless you. Um, it's when you shift your key to three over two X. So you, you're here instead of home. And all these different schools use this in a very different way, which hasn't been done before, but what they were trying to do is develop music through a nationalistic lens. They wanted their own particular sounds, and they used music to express this. 
They also use music to express the romantic ideals of adventure and putting the human emotion at the front, which is way different than Bach. So if we go all the way back here to Baroque, Bach thought that music was in service of God and that he viewed himself as a craftsperson. Like he wasn't spewing emotion onto a page. He was building a chair. He was building a work of craft. Here it's completely different. It's no longer a craft. They don't really care about form very much anymore. What they're trying to do is convey the human spirit. Here you see people like Mahler um, from the German school, Mazorsky from the Russian school, um, Poulenc from the French school, and all those three guys existing at the same time have extremely different sounds because of their nationalities. From romantic period, we get today. Now, this trend continues today, and as you know, it's very hard to see things that you're living in, so it's hard to analyze today from a historical standpoint. Um, nearly impossible. But we can look at some of the harmonies that have survived. So from the Romantic period, there's a school that believes that her, her, harmony is dead. Um, this is called the New Viennese School, and it's through Germany. And they disregard completely <laughs> all the construction of the, uh, the overtone series. Um, they don't really care about Beethoven's harmony, they don't care about classical form, they don't care about the, uh, I guess they care about the relation of music to the human. But they develop a system called serialism, where all 12 notes of the Western scale, one thing, this is important. If we keep taking the fifth, like we go up here too, and we do this enough times, you'll get 12 notes from C to C. And they'll be arranged in what are called half steps. It'll sound like this. What serialist composers do is they take all 12 of the notes and they arrange them into one melody. Each note can usually be played an arbitrary amount of times. They, these guys are really big on math. Like some of them will throw a bowling ball down at bowling pins, and depending on how many pins got hit and which ones, they would construct their melodies like that. So they weren't constructing. <laughs> <laughs> That's really true. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're members of a bowling league and, and an orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, pretty much. <laughs> some of them didn't even play music, like. There's this famous piece called Cage 422 where, y you know it, he gets on stage and the, the music is what's happening in the crowd. So he opens the piano and he sits there and it's a blank piece of music. You wait four minutes and 22 seconds. And people four minutes and 33. At 40 33? Mm -hmm. uh, there, thank you. It's, it's virtually the same thing. Though. Yeah, the, the, the point is there is the music is what's happening in that moment. It's people coughing, it's people shuffling in the chairs. You can hear the impatience. These guys, maybe that's, that's another progress uh, step in music where they're breaking tonality in new, where they're getting to the philosophy of tonality and they're actually composing with that. But there are some people, so this is one school of today, there are also people who come out of Bernstein's school. And you guys probably know him from West Side Story, really famous musical. Um, he believed that the death of tonality was the death of music because Music to him had to be pleasing to the human ear to be considered music, or at least go back and forth between the two. Like, even Beethoven didn't stay over here all the time. He needed home. Beethoven needed home for a way to be meaningful. It was a relationship again. And Bernstein thinks that serialism is just this awful school of philosophy where people are projecting their ideas on a beautiful harmonic language and robbing it of its intrinsic meaning. And a lot of the composers, especially within the Russian school, the modern Russian school has really held to the idea that harmony is extremely important in the central part of music. <laughs>